Well, welcome to Central Baptist Paragol Campus. Like Blake said, my name is Caleb McElyay. I am the student director here. I'm not just some random, large, hairy guy up on, up on stage. I do work here. Um, but um, it's been awesome to get to be at this campus and get to experience God. Um, and I'm just so excited about today. Um, if you would, you can open your Bibles and you can turn to 1 John 4, and we'll be in verses 1 through 6. And so we're going to be talking today about how we can, how, how we can test what we what we hear in this world and how we can know who we are in Christ. But I have a story first to tell you. So I have this friend, his name is Bryson, and he is like 6'5", 315 uh, that's pounds, and I'm, I'm 6'1", like 320, so I'm, we're both big, big people. And we were going deer hunting, so we looked like two walruses walking around in the woods, just dragging, and we, we weren't going to see a deer. We, it was a big waste of time, but we wanted to go hunt. And so we went and we hunted, and obviously all we saw was a bunch of squirrels, and uh, we were walking back out, and there was this fence line on our right. And we, we were walking up the fence line, and all of a sudden, I heard, ch -ch, ch -ch, like leaves moving the, on, on the ground. And I'm like, oh boy. So we start getting closer and closer. And it's like we're about to meet whatever's walking on the other side of the fence. Or we're, we're going to meet it in its path. And so Bryce's like, get your gun up, get your gun up. So I pick my gun up, and it's getting louder. Ch -ch, ch -ch, ch -ch. And I'm like, Oh boy, I hope it's a big one because I'm hungry. And so I, I get my gun up and it keeps coming sh -sh, louder and sh -sh, louder. And all of a sudden, I, I'm getting right here and I'm so ready, I'm so anxious, I'm so nervous. And all of a sudden, a horse pops out. And I said, Oh my goodness, I about shot a horse right in the head. <laughs> well, one, horses are expensive, so I've been out a lot of money. And two, I like horses, they're cool. And so it was very near disaster there and my buddy yelled don't shoot and I was oh no and I just it flipped out it was it was bad and that tells you how bad of a deer hunter I am I like to duck hunt and all that stuff but I'm not a deer hunter my friends will attest to that I'm, I'm not that but anyway I didn't tell you that story to just tell you a funny story about me almost shooting a horse the the the, the point of that story is that I mean, sometimes we hear things in life. We hear um, media. We hear um, news channels. We hear our friends. We hear people at school. We hear people at our work. Uh, we hear people on TV, um, preachers and, and, and people who teach. We hear all kinds of messages and information. And sometimes it's not what, what we think it is. I thought I heard a deer walking through the woods, and I thought I was about to shoot it. But in reality, it was a completely different species. It was a horse. And so... Oftentimes when we think we're hearing something, it may not always be the case. And so as you sit down, as you sat down today and you came and you were going to listen to a message, I want you guys to, to put yourself inside of this and say, man, where am I at today? Am I struggling with believing what God says about Jesus? Or am, am I struggling and believing what, if the Bible's true, am I struggling and believing um, if I'm enough, if I'm good enough to be able to, to, to make it to heaven? Or if, if I'm, I'm struggling to believe if I'm, I um, really am saved, if I'm really loved by Jesus. And so I hope that we can answer some of those questions this morning. And so, again, we'll be in 1 John uh, 4, 1 through 6. And let's read, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming, and now, now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. And we are from God, and he who knows God listens to us, and he who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of error. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you so much for um, waking people up this morning to be able to come and listen to your word be preached, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would remove every imperfection from me, Lord, and that you would just speak through me and speak through your eternal word, Lord, Lord, and that I would remain out of the way, Lord. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you so much for the fact that you have given us a way to be with you forever, Lord. Thank you so much for the cross and what it means in our life. In your name I pray. Amen. And so... We hear in that, we, we say, do not be gullible. That's my, that's my first thought when I read that. Do not be gullible. It's easy to believe um, everything you hear. In, in the first three verses, it says we want to test what we hear. That's our first point. Test what we hear. We do not want to be gullible and believe in everything. 
Um, I think about as a little kid, it's really easy um, to believe what you're told. You're a very gullible person. And in some ways, we're still little, we are literal, literal children of God. But in other words, we're supposed to be discerning children of God. We're supposed to, 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 to listen to what God says in his word. We're supposed to discern. We're not supposed to be gullible and believe everything we hear. Some context behind this is Blake and Breck have been teaching on it the past couple weeks in 1 John, is that John is writing to the early church. And what is happening is, is early people who went to the church um, and who had false, pro- had false professions or whatever, but they had left the church and they were trying to get other Christians, believing Christians, to leave. And they were creating logically sound arguments. They were creating um, arguments like, man, you don't need that. So that, that that's, you don't need all that. Um, but we, we can't believe everything we hear. We can't be gullible. And um, we have to be strong in standing for what we believe. He declares in this passage, do not believe everything, but test the spirits. He is telling you and telling me, do not believe everything, but test Test the spirits. And we're going to talk about how we can test um, those spirits. But testing is using biblical discernment. Um, discernment is another word for distinguish. How, how, how can we distinguish from right or from wrong? There's absolute truth and there's absolute wrong. There's no, uh, we, we can't just believe and, and say, well, everything's okay. There has to be something that's true, which is God's word and something that isn't. Um, we shouldn't just willy-nilly believe anything and everything that we hear. There are many things that are entering the church now that we should be wary of. Behind every statement is a spirit. And when we say spirit, um, that can kind of sound kind of mystical, but what we're saying is behind every statement is a prerogative or a, uh, an agenda or um, something we want to push as people. And that's a natural human thing. We, we are born into sin. We are born as selfish individuals. And oftentimes we want to push our own agenda or push what, what we believe um, is to be Right. But listen here, it says behind every statement is a spirit or a prerogative. Being people, everything we say or do has some type of meaning behind it. And as Christians, we should seek true meaning behind what people say or what we hear. As Christians, we have to be able to seek what is true and what is right, which is found in God's word. I'm not saying we should argue over everything. Everything inside of the, there's so many churches that have been destroyed by arguments and people who uh, get upset about Small things. You always heard the argument, well, or, or the illustration that, that that church fell apart because they didn't like the color of the carpet, or that church fell apart because they painted the walls wrong. Well, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when people are telling you um, important, key um, things about our faith, like how can we be saved? Well, through Jesus Christ and believing in Him and repenting of our sins. Um, people will say, man, you got to work to get to heaven. You got to be able to earn your way to heaven. That's false. You can't earn your way to heaven. You have to. But you have to put your trust and faith in him. Our works are a complement to our salvation. They are not the, 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 the way we get saved. Our works are a result or a complement of our salvation. In Christ, when someone who is speaking with some sort of, some sort of spirit or prerogative that is not a God, that we should test that and see if it holds it. Why? It's been happening ever since the, the creation of people. In the garden in Genesis 3, where the fall happens, when Adam and Eve eat from the, from the tree of life. And they are, in, they are enlightened. They, are, they, they have seen good and evil all of a sudden. And, then, and Satan has deceived them. What's, what's cool, well, not cool, but what's tricky about this is that oftentimes we think Satan wants to directly oppose us. We say, Satan's on this line and I'm on this side. And we're directly fighting head to head. And that's not necessarily what happens. What happens a lot is Satan is trying to stay on the same side as you and is trying to, trying to trick you to go over the other side. He is, uh, doesn't necessarily oppose, but he deceives. He weaves some truth into his lie. And, and that's what happens a lot. That's what happens whenever you start believing that you're not good enough to be able to, to accept Jesus as your Lord. And say. That's what happens when you say, you know what? I don't know if I can believe this Bible because there, there's things inside of it that, that don't sound right. No, that's, what, that's Satan deceiving you because there's evidence, and there's so much evidence, and we don't have time to go into all of it today, but there's evidence that, that for Jesus, and there's evidence for this scripture that it is wholly authentic, it is infallible, infallible it's, it's completely perfect. There are, many that have, there are many that have come and before he tricked us, like we said in Adam and Eve. I think I've got a great illustration for this. I'll show you, uh, put my wallet, there's a, Got some money in here. I was, I was going to do this, 
with a fake bill, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. But um, so I used to work. Um, some of my friends in here have done the same thing. We did this thing called Orlando Project. And it is um, with a campus ministry um, at A-State. I went to A-State. And you go down to Orlando, and it's a discipleship and evangelism training 10-week program. And so you're there for 10 weeks, and you're doing all these awesome things. But you also work at SeaWorld. So I have worked at SeaWorld. I actually worked at Aquatica, which is a water park at SeaWorld. It's not glamorous. It's not. Uh, I stood in the hot sun all day. And sold T-shirts. So uh, if you want to go work at SeaWorld, don't do what I did. But um, what they do is they also train you how to be a teller. And they train you how to um, learn how to distinguish what is uh, good money or, or, or real money and fake money. And so what I have is a real $20 bill. I was going to get a fake one from Chris Davenport. He's a trooper here, but he said I'd get arrested if I brought out a fake bill. Uh, because they have those locked away in insecure places where people like me can't get them. Um, but so I have a real bill. And there are different ways you can test it to see if it's real. You can draw on it with a marker, and if the ink turns a certain color, it's fake. If you can, um, do all kinds of things that you can look at it. But there's two main ways that people are able to tell if a bill is real and a bill is fake. The first one is this. You take the bill, and it's, they have these people who, who work um, like in tellers and, and, and do different cash registers and stuff, and they make them look at real money all day long. You look at real money... And you study, you say, okay, well, there's emblems here, and there's um, words here, and there's, uh, th there's, there's a hologram here, and you can see the picture of the, some eagle in it, and, and there's different things that you can see, that, and, and they study real money. And so whenever you see fake money, it's easier to distinguish. And that's the same way we have to be um, as Christians. We have to say, you know what, I'm going to surround myself with people who are of the same agenda, the same mindset, the same love of Christ that I am. I'm going to be around real Bible-believing, following Jesus Christians. That's one way we can see when things aren't going, when, when, when things are kind of off, when someone's feeding you something that's not true, is we can surround ourselves with people and say, do you think that's true? And you know he's reading the same scripture you are, and he's like, I don't think that's true, and you can talk about it. Another way they do it is they use light. Now, I've got a flashlight up here, and what they'll do is, is they take the flashlight, and this is going to be hard to see because i got big fat hands and they're in the way, but uh, I've got a flashlight here and you can see through the paper and you can see um, all the little um, pictures that are inside of it that, are, that you couldn't normally see before. You can see different emblems inside of it and you can see any flaws or imperfections inside of it. And that's the same way with God's word. And many times in the scripture, God's word is referred to as, as light. God is referred to as light and his scripture is referred to as light. And so what, what we do with money is we show, is, is we put it up to light and it illuminates and it exposes. It illuminates the things that are real or it exposes the things that aren't real, the things that are fake. And that's the same way that the Bible does for us. And we look and they say, wait, well, should I be doing that? We hold God's word up to it and we read it and we say, is this really what I should be doing? Is this really the way I should be reacting? Is this really the way I should be handling situations? Is this really the way I need to live my life? And what it'll do is it'll either illuminate the fact that, man, I'm a Bible-believing Christian who, who, who stinks, who, still, who sins still, who is not perfect, but I'm seeking after God. Or it's going to say, man, your life doesn't really look at all like this Bible. Your life does not look at all what's inside of the Scripture. And that's the thing we have to understand is that we have to look to Scripture because this is, what's, this is the reason Scripture is so important. There's three things that are eternal. I've heard this before. It's not original to me. But there's three things that are eternal. There's God, the souls of men and women, my soul and your soul, and his word. And so when we understand that this is one of the three things on this planet that are eternal, it holds much deeper meaning than what it did 30 seconds ago when you weren't thinking of it in that, in that light. That this is eternal. This is the bread of life. This is perfect and holy and, and God-breathed. And, and in 2 Timothy, it says that it's God-breathed. And so when we understand that, we can hold it up to our life and say, does my life look like this? And that's what I want you to do is, is, is as you move forward from today, it, look, at the, look at Scripture, read Scripture, dive into Scripture, have a thirst for Scripture. And if your life does not look like it, then there's an issue there. 
In verse 2 and 3, it says this. It says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard and that is coming and that, you've already, and that is already in the world. Everything comes down to Jesus. Um, when I ask you, uh, if I were to ask you in private, what, what's your uh, definition or what do you think about Jesus or, or what is your view on Jesus, you can tell about 95% of a person's um, faith based on their view of Jesus. Because Jesus is the hinge point. Jesus is um, what we put our faith and trust in. If Jesus was a liar, then we shouldn't be doing this. But he's not a liar. And that's why we're here meeting together and diving into his word. Jesus is the son of God who came down in earthly form to save us from a life of sin and death. Everything hinges on that. Allah didn't save it, send anyone down. Joseph Smith, who's the leader of Mormonism, didn't save the world from sin. No other religious figure claims to do what Jesus does. And maybe that's not your, your problem. Maybe that's not. I understand who Jesus is. I, I believe that he came down. But we have to connect it to is if you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, then we should be looking at this and saying, let this light illuminate and expose the things that are maybe off in my life, the things that I'm not really proud of, the, the hidden dark places. Because this is what's crazy is that light exposes and it illuminates and it exposes the darkest little nooks and crannies and it, and it exposes the biggest voids. Light overcomes everything. And so when we understand how powerful light is and how the Bible is literally the light of the world and how it, it, it illuminates and it exposes, then we can understand how important Jesus is in this. If anyone tries to water down what Jesus did on the cross for us, then that, is, that person is lying to you and they're trying to deceive you, just like it says in the text. Jesus is the, the perfect, holy um, son of God who came down to earth, born of a virgin, and lived a perfect, sinless life for you and for me. And you've heard that story a thousand times. But it never gets old because it's, it's the perfect story. It's the story of how we can be saved from, from death. We, 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 don't have to, we don't have to live in the same way. So I encourage you to think about that this morning. Now, you may ask, I don't know if I'm being deceived because I don't know who I am in Christ Jesus. I don't really know if I've even made a relationship with Christ. In order to know how not to be deceived, you must first understand who we are. So our second point this morning is know who you are in Christ. Let's read in verse 4. It says, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, but he who knows God listens to us. He, is not, he who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. One of the key things I want you to see in, in, in this is in, is in verse 4. It says, you are from God, little children. If you have accepted Jesus, if you have made a decision to follow him, you are a child of God. There's nothing that you have done or are going to do for the rest of your life that can take you out of God's hand once you're put in it. Romans 8, um, 38 and 39 talks about how there's nothing in this world that can separate you from Christ's hand, from Christ's love. There's nothing, nothing. And so when we think about, man, I've done so many wrong things. I've done so many, many bad things in this world. I, I can't, I, I, could never, I could never be God's child. Are you kidding me? And I think about my own father. I mean, I love my dad, and he would do anything in this world for me. Whether I left and, and, and abandoned the family or did, or did whatever I wanted, or did, did whatever in the world, he would always love me. He would always protect me. He would always be for me. And I'm proud to, like, to have a father like that. I'm proud to be able to put my, his last name on my back and, and be able to represent him and the, and the people who come before and who were father to him and who taught him how to be a man. And some of you may not have that ability. Some of you, I understand, there's broken homes, there's broken families. This world, luckily, is not our home. Like Archie always says, this world is not your forever home. And there are things that are imperfect in this world, like how you may not have had the, the, the wonderful father like I've had. But what we can, what, what, what's crazy is, is that 
We have a father who loves us no matter what. And he's our heavenly father. And he has the ability to do anything. He has the ability to forgive any sin. He has the ability to forgive anything you've ever done to him. He has the ability to forgive you for anything that you've ever done in this world. He has that crazy ability. How much more pride can we take in knowing that we have a heavenly father who loves us and who cares for us and who desires to have a relationship with us? I mean, I love my, own, I love my earthly father, but how much, how much more is it to know we have a, a, an eternal father? How much more? It's, it's, it's in. That's unfathomable. Also in verse 4 it says, we are victorious children of God. When we have Christ, we cannot lose. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Man, some people in here have lost a lot. Whether you've lost a lot of family members, whether you've lost people to death and disease and heartache, whether you've just been lost in in the world, you haven't been able to succeed in a lot of things, um, or maybe you have. But again, we can look to this truth is that you're from God, little children, and you have overcome them because greater who, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. God wins. You're victorious. What's awesome about being a Christian is we know the end. We know what happens. There's so many hot button topics and things that um, enrage us as people and, and, are, and are against what we believe. But what's awesome is that we are victorious because God is victorious. God is, God, God is perfect. God is holy. And God has already won the battle. We know what's going to happen. And so when we understand that, we, we should know that, man, we are victorious in Christ. We are victorious because of the way he loves us. Also, we are indwelt children of God. It says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. God lives inside of us. We have the Holy Spirit who vouches for us and who lives inside of us and who, and who is for us on our behalf. And that's crazy in itself too, that we can have God living inside of us. And so the only way to have that though is if we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and if we ask him to forgive us of our sins. And that's the only way that can happen. But if that does happen, you're victorious, you have God living inside of you. You, you were his son, you were his daughter. Lastly, we are discerning children of God. It says in verse 6, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We are, dis- we are discerning or we are di- uh, distinguishing children of God. We, we can distinguish right from wrong. And that's a gift that God gives us, but only if you're in Christ. If you say, man, I don't know if I can be able to test all that. I don't know if I'm going to be able to no right from wrong. I don't know if I'm going to be able to know truth from error. You have to be a child of God first. It doesn't work the other way. You have to be a child of God in order to be able to discern right from wrong. There's this really cool video I want them to play in a second, but I'm going to give some precursor for it. It, it really sets up how much Christ loves us, but also how much... Um, how, how, how much Christ is inside of us too. And so this is a, this is a famous movie um, and I'm not saying this is directly, this, this is God, but it, it has a lot of impact and I want you guys to listen and to really tune in on this. So you go and play, play the video. Look hard. You see, He lives in you. Father? Simba, you have forgotten me. No. How could I? You have forgotten who you are and so forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. You must take your place in the circle of life. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember. 
Now, I'm not saying that, that Jesus is a line in the sky, but what I, or God is a line in the sky. But what I am saying is that there's so much truth in that. There's truth in knowing that Jesus lives inside of us like, like he told Simba. He said, I am inside of you. You are my son. He also says, remember who you are, to know who you are. Remember that you're not just a, a, a blob on this planet just orbiting around a lot of other planets and you have no meaning. But remember that you are a God-created son and daughter of Christ, that God knit you together in your mother's womb, that God loves you, that God cares for you, that God desires to know you on an intimate, personal relationship. But you have to accept him first. You have to, you have to, you have to accept that gift, just like Simba had to accept that his father was telling him the truth. We must remember that we are children of Christ. We must understand that we are sons and daughters of Christ. Remember that Christ is the ultimate authority and the only way to truly be his child is to abide in him, to live in him, to hold God's word up and say, I'm going to live inside of this. I'm going to use this to expose and to illuminate things in my life. We must accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. Some of you here today need to do that. Some of you have been running into many other things that don't satisfy. Some of you have said, you know what? I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that in order to satisfy the hole in our heart that is, that's there for everyone. There's, everyone in this room has a hole in their heart, has something that, that, that can't satisfy us completely. But only Christ can do that. Some of you in here today have made a decision to follow Jesus a long time ago, but you know what? You've, you've turned away. You've stopped running towards Jesus. You've gotten distracted. There's all kinds of things that may have happened, that, that excuses we could use. But there's a reason that we talked about this today. There's a reason that Christ put it on Blake's heart to put this, Blake and Archie's heart to put this in the message for this week, for this point in the year, for this exact moment. It's for that some of you here, and if some of you, somebody in here has said, man, I've been running far away from Christ. I once was with him, but now I'm not. Or some of you in here have never made Christ a, a point at all in your life. Some of you have said, you know what? I don't know if that's for me. I'm, I'm, that's not for me. Some of you um, think that you're making Christ a point in your life, but if we were to hold God's word up to your life and to anyone's life in here, would it look, would it illuminate or would it expose, basically? Would it illuminate how God is working in your life or would it expose the hidden dark corners of your life that no one wants to see, that, that you don't want anyone to see? Christ has the ability to change us forever, but only if we allow him to. Only if we accept the free gift of salvation. But you have to let him, you have to, you have to submit. You have to say, I can't do it on my own. Some people in here have tried doing it on their own for so long. You have tried... To, to make yourself happy. You've tried to make enough money. You've tried to uh, have the best looking girl. You've tried to do all these things when in reality, th there's, no, there's nothing you can do that can satisfy like Jesus and his word. And so as we enter this time of response, I'm about to pray for us, but I want you guys to understand that, that you need to respond in a way that Christ desires for you to respond. It's not an accident that you're in this room right now. There's no... Um, accidents that you're in this room because Christ ordained you to be in this room and you're in this room because you're called to respond in some type of way whether that be worship whether that be coming down in the front and talking to some of our counselors or Blake or Pastor Breck whether that be to recommit your life to Christ you know what I've been running but I need to recommit my life to Christ I need to I, I, I need to remember who I am remember who you are in Christ Respond in the way that you feel God calling you to respond. Let's pray. Lord God, you are a good, good father, Lord. And I thank you so much for the fact that, that you love us, for the fact that you, you desire for us, Lord, that, 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 you, that you pursue us, Lord. Lord, thank you for the fact that um, we can be your sons and daughters. Lord, that is amazing. It is crazy. It is it's unheard of, Lord, that we could be your sons. And, but, but Lord, you allow that to happen. Lord, I pray that you would move 
in this room today, Lord. I pray that you would continue to pursue people who are, who are fighting right now, Lord. They're saying, I don't want to respond in that way, Lord. Lord, but that you would, that you would move in the way that you see to move, Lord, and that you would let people respond in the way that they need to respond. Lord, thank you so much for the cross and for sending your son, Jesus. And you know I pray. Amen.